Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather, to come before you. Father, for your word. You've laid your entire plan out, Father. You've told your story of your reaching out to your people to bring us back to you. Father, it's my prayer that as we go into this study that the eyes of our understanding will be opened, that indeed that we will have ears to hear. Father, that the lesson would not be lost, but rather that we would be strengthened and encouraged to take the lesson and apply it and grow in you. I thank you for that. I pray, Father, that as we study that we may see your son, his promise, his appearing, his, the amazing things that he did, Father, to, to stand, to operate, to work, to desire, to do nothing more than your will, that it would be a that your purpose would be accomplished in our lives. And Father, we remember that this day especially, that indeed He is risen. That is your purpose, that is your plan, that just as He is risen to go before you, so too we will be raised, Father, to be presented to you and so forever be with you. We look forward to that blessed hope of His glorious appearing. Father, may we be prepared. May Your will be accomplished. May it be perfected within our lives that we might be presented to You. Father, indeed, is that spotless bride, one well prepared, who brings glory to Your Son. So lead us now by your Holy Spirit, I pray, and we just turn this time over into your hands. Father, and pray that thy will be done. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray this. Amen. So the book of Acts, we, we looked last time at the necessity for establishing the deacons. That they were the ones who were in charge of the outreach ministry. You know, their, their purpose was to go out and minister to the community. We looked at, you know, how that came about. It came about actually because of, a, of division within the body. And as this was brought up, you know, by the wisdom, by the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the apostles... Okay, the ones who functioned as elders, the ones, you know, particularly Peter functioned as the pastor. They determined that, you know, it was their job to be in prayer before the Lord. It was their job to be teaching the word. And, you know, the rest of the body should have been ministering to itself, taking care of itself. And the, in the needs of daily life. And so he, he said, you know, but... In order to keep a division, in order to keep a split from happening, we will appoint deacons. Those who will be in charge of ministering and in overseeing the ministry to the body, the outreach. And so we looked at the requirements of that, that they be full of the Holy Spirit, that they be men of dignity, you know, that, that they are of good character. And so it was the congregation themselves that picked the deacons said, yes, indeed, these guys are the real deal. They walk the walk. They talk the talk. You know, they, they obviously are full of the power of God in their life. These are the ones that, that we want appointed. And so out of that congregation of at least 5,000 at the time, seven were selected. And just... Personal opinion, I would say that the congregation was probably of 7,000 at the time. Just from the pattern of biblical history that, that there were those who were put in charge of the thousands. Okay, that seems to be a breakdown that, you know, that follows throughout, uh, throughout history. So just to oversee the ministry, the outreach, there were seven who were chosen. And the poster boy for the deacons was Stephen. 
he was noted. You know, when you look, he said, that, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He's the first one mentioned. This is the guy. And so they get that all straightened out. And so Stephen not only, you know, is in, in the context of his ministry, in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it said, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs, miracles and signs among the people. And he was preaching Jesus. And he goes out, and some folks really took a dim view to this. They are mentioned as um, from the synagogue of the freedmen, um, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, some from Cilicia and Asia rose up and argued with him. And these were guys who were very steeped in Greek philosophy. They knew all the sciences. They knew all this. You know, they were, they were the liberals. You know, they were the liberal arts majors, these guys, with, the, with very much what we would consider a Western mindset, reasoning things away. And they, they stood up and they argued with Stephen. And Stephen, full of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, remember we've been looking at John 14, 26, that, that the Lord will give us the Holy Spirit, the helper, and that he will bring to mind the things that have been taught, you know, so that we will know what to speak. And so they couldn't win. You know, here's Stephen, this young guy, arguing with them or, or presenting a witness. The very real sense of the word is that he was, before he was even killed, he was a martyr. Okay, martyr does not mean death. Martyr means one who is a good witness. And unfortunately today, it, it's even to the point of death. One who stands up and continues proclaiming Christ and stands as a good witness. And that's what Stephen did. They didn't like it, so they cooked up some accusations against him. And they brought him before the council. They brought him before the Sanhedrin. So here he is, the full Sanhedrin gets gets called together. This, this includes the high priest. This includes all the elders of both parties, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The scribes were there, the elders. Okay, so this was a full court session. This was the Supreme Court of Israel that Stephen was brought before. These were all the guys who were the doctors of the law. The guys that wrote scripture and you know the the teaching of the great rabbis and here's stephen he's a deacon gets brought before them and is falsely accused now remember the thing that tickles me is that the sadducees were the ones in control at the time the sadducees are the guys who denied the angelic they denied anything spiritual they denied miracles they denied the resurrection and then here's Stephen out there performing miracles, and they couldn't stand it. And so, as I got looking back and thinking about this, that there they are before the Sanhedrin. The high priest is a Sadducee. They were ruled by the Sadducees. Next slide, please. I had to back up to this verse because it just tickled me, the way it's recorded in here. Talk about the Holy Spirit having a sense of humor. In Acts 6, verse 15, it says, And fixing their gaze on him, okay, he's before the Sanhedrin, and fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin or in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Isn't that a hoot? These are the very guys running this thing who deny the existence of angels, but yet they all saw his face as the face of an angel. Had to absolutely unnerve them. I think that's so cool. And so then, next slide please. Acts chapter 7 verse 1, it says, and the high priest, okay, after this, these accusations have been brought, and the high priest said, are these things so? 
Referring to Stephen, verse 2, And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And said to him, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God removed him into this country in which you are now living. And he gave him no inheritance even, or in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Remember that time frame. And whatever nation to which they shall be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. So here's Stephen, falsely accused, put on trial for his life. Notice how he starts out. He starts out, hear me, brethren and fathers. These are terms of respect. This is grace under fire. He recognizes their kinship as Jews. They are his brethren. And he recognizes their role as elders, fathers, which is a title of deepest respect. This is how he starts out. Now think about that. When, what is your response when someone falsely accuses you? Or misrepresents the Lord, which they were doing? Do you get all riled up? Do you stammer, stutter, cuss, fume, yell? Determined to put them in their place? Cut them down? Recall that the role of deacon called for a man or woman of dignity. And so he stood before them and said, hear me brethren and fathers. And so he began making his point with Abraham. Okay, who's Abraham? He's the father of the faith. Okay, he was the first to be labeled a Hebrew. He was the venerated father of the faith. And, and he starts out by pointing to him right from the get-go. And look at what he says in verse 3. So the command to Abraham was depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Stephen's going to be setting up a defense here. And what he's going to end up doing is actually putting the Sanhedrin on trial by the time he's through with this. It's a very interesting pattern that he begins to set up and he's telling them, you're acting just like your forefathers have all this time starting from Abraham. And so the command initially was to depart from your land to the land that I will show you. So what happened when, when Abraham responded? Well, what he did was he moved from Ur of the Chaldees. He moved about 60 miles upstream and landed in Haran. Okay, that was where his great-grandfather had established a caravanserai. It was well known the family of Eber. And in fact, if you take in the Hebrew, you take Eber, one who comes from Eber is an Eberite. Well, to say that in Hebrew, it's Ebri. And Abraham first identifies himself as an Eb, as an Ebri, an Eberite. That's where we get Hebrew from. But he goes up there and, and he he just moves upstream. He doesn't go to the land that God showed him. He waited there until his father, Terah, died. And then he did what Yahweh had called him to do some 25 years later. Abraham got the call. He says, okay, I'll do that. But he, doesn't, he departs from his land partially. He goes about halfway, but he doesn't leave his relatives. He waits until his father dies. And then sets out. 
a time span of about 25 years. So what was Stephen's point? His point was that Abraham had about a 25-year lapse of faith, a 25-year lapse of obedience to Yahweh. That was his point, and it was well known. They didn't argue the point. They didn't argue any of these points. But what's interesting is that this is not mentioned of Abraham in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, verse 8. What does that mean? That means that that sin had been blotted out. It's an amazing thing. But he brings it up here as a matter of fact to show the conduct of their faith, just like the faith of the fathers. But we see that Abraham did continue on in the faith. And the point about the land is that it was promised to Abraham's seed. It was promised to Abraham's seed when Abraham and Sarah were both beyond childbearing age. Remember, Sarah giggled, you know, at the thought. You see, it was when they stepped out in faith that time. And what we see associated with that promise, like we talked about in Sunday school this morning, that's when their names went from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. What was, what was added was the Hebrew letter He, the H, which is a symbol of things that are spiritual. They quit walking according to the flesh and stepped out in faith according to the Spirit. And even though Abraham knew that he would not inherit that land, he knew that it would be for his children. From that point forward, he continued to act in faith. So the second time, he got it right. Next slide, please. So Stephen is next going to talk about Joseph. He's next in line. And there's a couple of things to bear in mind about Joseph. Okay, number one, I think it was um, Arthur Pink who came up with a list of 101 ways in which Joseph is the foreshadow or he was a type of the Messiah. The story of Joseph is very much the story, it parallels the story of Messiah in the things that happened in his life, the way that he was treated, all the little particulars in the story. So we see Joseph come on the scene in Genesis 37. And in Genesis, let's see, let me get there. Genesis 37, starts out this way. It said, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. Now, these are the records of the generation of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. So the first thing just to notice is that he's called a youth. Some translations will say he was a lad. Okay, the word, the Hebrew word, is the Hebrew word na'ar. And it actually, there's a similar word that means a youth or a lad. But this particular spelling of it carries a connotation of priestly duty. You will see that several of the very prominent Men of God throughout the Bible are called a Na'ar. Even in their old age, they're called a Na'ar. And it makes no sense. It's like, how can this old dude, you know, like Samuel or, or you know, Elisha, he's a Na'ar. How can this be? He's old. He's not some youth. The word actually it carries a connotation of priestly duty. This was one who was assigned in the family to, to rightly handle the word of God, to teach it, and to act as a judge. 
Remember, the priests were judges. They knew the word of God, they were familiar with it, and they would make a determination as to conduct based on the word of God. And so many times we think, well, judging means condemning a person. No, judging is, is a matter of looking at character, behavior, or actions and making a determination. Is this in keeping with the word of God? So Joseph, in this sense, he was, he was both this, he had this priestly ability and it also talks, it's a combined role of that plus rulership or headship. And it's one of those strange mixtures which he was, in a sense, both a king and a priest. Okay, to kind of take those terms loosely. It will later be commanded of Israel that they could not be both kings and priests because they couldn't handle it. But here Joseph was. And yet in Christ Jesus, you and I are called both kings and priests. As is Jesus. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek who was both king and priest at Salem. So like Jesus, Joseph was put in charge of his father's flock. And he brought back this bad report about his brothers. This bad report, the term there, it has to do with their character, with their conduct. They were conducting themselves in an ungodly manner, in other words. And so Joseph comes back and he executes a priestly function by recognizing their conduct and reporting it to the Father, turning it over to the Father. So that's what we see described there. Next slide, please. And then we see the other, in verse 3, it says, Now Israel, that's Jacob's other name, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored or a multicolored tunic. The other aspect of this, in the old age of Israel, you might say in his latter days, he made Joseph this coat of many colors that caused jealousy among his brothers. Okay, now these guys, these were, these boys, they were ruffians. They were manly men. You know, when you read the histories about them, so it's not like they were sitting out there making a fashion statement or a fashion judgment against Joseph. That's not the idea behind this multicolored coat. You see, each one of the boys would have had a colored robe or tunic that represented their family, just like the 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Each one represented one of the boys like a family flag or a family crest. So what's behind this is Joseph had a tunic that had a base color to it with ten colored stripes on it. One for each one of the brothers. Okay, representing rulership or headship over them. Much like you see those sergeants you know, that have stripes from, that start here and go all the way up their sleeve. It's a sign of authority. Except, see, Joseph was still young when this happened. He was 17, and it angered his brothers that their father chose him. Well, let's, let's rephrase that a little bit. They did not agree with the way the father chose to do things. They didn't agree with who the father chose to put in charge. Much like the Jews at the time when Jesus showed up, they didn't agree with the Father's choice. That's not what they had in mind. And so we all know the story of Joseph from there. So picking back up in Acts chapter 7. And so here's Stephen. Stephen's a young guy. And he's sitting there giving the Sanhedrin, the most distinguished scholars in all of Israel, a Bible lesson, a Bible history. He continues in verse 8. <clears throat> and he gave him the covenant of circumcision, referring to Abraham. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob um, of the twelve patriarchs. 
And the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. And yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay, Pharaoh is just a title. Pharaoh, it means the big house or the one who lives in the big house. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt and there passed away he and our fathers. And from there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. So the tribes of Israel rejected their father's appointed leader and priest the first time, only to recognize him the second time. After a time of trouble, after a time of famine, and it was then that the family was gathered together. Okay, so you see a pattern starting to develop here. In verse 14, Stephen, he's quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay, this is one of those points in here where people will say, ooh, there's a discrepancy in the Bible. Okay, so Stephen is, is quoting from the Greek translation, and he said that the number of those in Egypt was 75. The problem is, is that the Hebrew text says that there were 70. And the scholars and the rabbis know that, that the additional five were from those who were added in Egypt. But they just don't know which ones. They can't agree on which ones. But they know that, that there were five added in Egypt, so that was the total strength of the family. But I find it interesting that the nation of believers grew by five the number of God's grace, and the number associated with things of the Spirit. There's one other area where some have said that there's a discrepancy in the Bible in what Stephen said. Note that they don't, you know, while he's on trial, these guys don't refute what he's saying. What he's saying, they, they recognize as a matter of fact, as a matter of truth. They don't like it, what he's getting at, but they don't dispute the facts. But it's in regard to verse 16, where some commentators say that he mentions the wrong burial place. Okay, and I'm just going to give you a couple of scripture references here. If you look closely at Genesis 23:17 and Genesis 33:19, you will see that the two places are not in contradiction as to where the fathers were buried. Okay, Abraham, Genesis 23, 17, he bought the first one in Machpelah where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah are buried. Jacob, he did buy a second burial place in Shechem where Joseph and perhaps the 12 patriarchs are buried, all 12 patriarchs. The reason why the Jews don't like mentioning that is because Shechem is in Samaria. And they don't want to fess up to the fact that, that the 12 patriarchs are, are buried in heathen territory, in other words. But there are several ancient historians who point this out as being so. I can get where you're buried. To them it does. Not to them it does. Because, you know, the, the, the way they look at it, well, they're over there and, and remember the story of the Good Samaritan? You know, that heathen that they didn't want to associate with? Well, to them, the patriarchs, they're buried over in heathen territory and it just bothers them. How could the Almighty allow that to happen? Because they're over there in heathen territory and not in the promised land. So that's where, where that comes in. Have you ever them yet? 
Yeah, they do know where they're, where they're oh, at. Okay. Next slide, please. But at this time, verse 17, but at this time of which the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. So notice that God acts according to his time and according to his promises. He had told Abraham the amount of time that they would spend in bondage before being free. And this is where another seeming discrepancy pops up. If you do the math in Exodus 12, verses 40 through 41, and if you look at Galatians 3.17, where Paul tells us they spent 430 years down there. Galatians what? 317. And yet Genesis 15.13 tells us, and Stephen tells us here in verse 6, that they spent 400 years there. So which one is correct? Actually both. Okay, and, and one of the clues is found here. Remember, they spent 400 years in bondage, was the prophecy. Okay. Under a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Okay, another arose. And the word another here is heteros. It was a king, but of a different type. Versus the word alos, which means another of the same type. The Pharaoh that Joseph served by history was Ethiopian, of Ethiopian descent. And according to Isaiah 52, 4, this last Pharaoh who did not know Joseph was Assyrian. The Assyrians are bad news for Israel. Okay, modern day Assyria is Iran, basically. The Antichrist will be Assyrian, or from the Assyrian Empire. And so what it works out to is they served 30 years under a pharaoh, an Ethiopian, who was sympathetic towards them, who was kind towards them, and then 400 years under one who was not and who oppressed them. Another way you can look at it, if you count 400 years from the time of recognition of Isaac in Genesis 21, 12 forward, it's 400 years. So, continuing on. Next slide, please. And it was he who took shrewd advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. And it was at this time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God. And he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. And Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. And he was a man of power in words and deeds. Ooh, Moses lied. Actually, he didn't lie. Remember when he went to, when God called him? He's like, ah, but I can't speak. I'm like, nah, he's just, that was an excuse. He was a man mighty in, in words and deeds. Okay. Several of the historians note that he was particularly raised and groomed to assume the rulership of Egypt. Pharaoh's dot, Pharaoh at that time, it is said, had no sons. So Pharaoh's daughter took him in and raised him as her own son. And he was trained in the finest of military arts, the sciences, math, astronomy, geometry, hieroglyphics, philosophy. Remember, a lot of this originated in, in Egypt. Their, their mathematic skills alone are phenomenal, unequal, you know, except by modern computers. You know, and, and how did they come about this? Well, it was, again, according to the histories, it was handed down by the watchers, by the fallen angels. But so they, there was this huge school of math, of, I mean, in Moses, he was schooled and he was groomed in it all. And so here he comes as this man to lead them out of this oppression. Next slide, please. 
Verse 23 says, But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren. So he stepped out of Pharaoh's courts to go see, you know, to go back to his roots, to see what's going on there with the children of Israel, okay, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together. And he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? And at this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So what's the picture? Here comes the deliverer the first time. And they were too busy fighting amongst themselves and brought accusation against him. They didn't realize that they even needed someone to deliver them. That, that's the state that they were in, and so Moses left. Next slide, please. Continuing in verse 30. And after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. And when Moses saw it, he began to marvel at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans. And I have come down to deliver them. Come now and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So finally, after 40 years, the one they originally sent led them out. Moses grew up. He was being groomed to take over in Egypt for 40 years. He fled, spent 40 years in Midian. And then finally came back and he started his career at age 80. Amazing. But notice again this charge of being, you know, who made you ruler and a judge? And as I mentioned, it was the priests who were trained to handle the word of God and perform the role of judges. Just as we're called to do. Okay, and so here is Moses in this role as ruler and judge, king and priest in other words. And they deeply resented that. And that's what's being set up here. And we see Messiah, you know, again, he is both a king and a priest. We'll see that a little bit later on. Next slide, please. Verse 37, this is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. You recall that Jesus was asked, you know, if he was the prophet, this is what's being referred to. He refers to himself as the one that Moses predicted. He, and Moses, at this point in time, when Stephen is talking to the Sanhedrin, Moses, the one that they, re, you know, that the fathers rejected the first time, they absolutely venerated Moses at the time of Stephen, even more than the word of God. You know, it was, well, whatever Moses said goes. And it's like, this is the guy that you guys rejected. Don't you know your history? And so he continues in verse 38. He said, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel 
and who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers. And he received living oracles to pass on to you. And our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know him. what happened to him. And at that time they made a calf and brought sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it was written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship them, I also will remove um, you. I will also remove you beyond Babylon because of them, in other words. So again, with Moses, they rebelled. They went back to incorporating pagan ways. And here we find out that it was more than just the golden calf. It involved astrology. Okay, that star of the small g god Rampha. Okay, it involved the worships of the gods of the planets. The god Rampha here is associated with Saturn. The worship of Saturn's, Saturn's day replaced the Sabbath in what we today know as Saturday. Saturday literally means Saturn's day. That replaced the term Sabbath. It's the basis for the winter worship of Saturnalia, what we know today as Christmas. That's what they brought in. That's what they wanted to incorporate in their worship, along with worshiping Moloch, the one that they would sacrifice their children to, in a custom no different than abortion today. In fact, spiritually speaking, it is, it is the spirit of Moloch that, that demon Moloch that is behind abortion today, the driving to sacrifice children. And so there's many parallels with the children of Israel and what they went through in our culture today that Stephen's bringing up here. Next slide, please. He continues, he says, And our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern in which he had seen. And this is just an interesting note. You know, so many times, you know, according to the movies, Moses came down with the two tablets. Twice. But... You know, it would, it would have been a cool depiction to also have him, you know, with the armful of, like, architect's drawings. You know, detailed drawings that he came down with. Because he received the very plans for the tabernacle and worship based on what he had seen in heaven. God was very particular about the way that he was to be worshipped. And Moses took very detailed descriptions of that and brought it down and, and instituted it. So, just an interesting note. Next slide, please. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it, brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Remember, one of the... One of the accusations that was brought was that Stephen was being accused of going around saying that Jesus said, I will tear this temple down. You know, and they were taking that out of, out of context 
And they were making an accusation that they were threatening the very house of God. And Stephen says, you know, it's right here in your own writing that, you know, second go around, you know, there's Solomon who built this temple. But God says, I don't, that's not my confinement. You know, and, and it became down to the point where it was the tabernacle that they revered, this building. You know, like many do with the building of the church, where the center of worship, you know, it's, well, you begin worship the moment that you step in the building and then you stop when you leave. God says, no, I don't, I don't roll that way. It's, you know, this is just where y'all come to gather. But I'm to be worshipped everywhere. You can't confine me to one place. And so, you know, the object of worship for them became the temple. And Stephen points that out to them. Next slide, please. And so Stephen ends now on a personal note. He says, you men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. So he brings the history lesson home. The entire series of first time failures only to hopefully get it right a second time. His point is that they too denied and killed the sent one, their very own Messiah. And it won't be until the second time that they will receive him. And it will bring him much trouble as a result. He addresses them as stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. In other words, they still have flesh attached. They looked at things fleshly from their fleshly nature. And that they always resisted the Holy Spirit. And I find that very interesting. Here he was addressing the group led by those who denied having anything to do with the supernatural. And apparently the whole time the Holy Spirit was available to them. Remember we talked about the fact that they marveled, it unnerved them that there was healing taking place. It unnerved them that demons were being cast out. It unnerved them that signs and wonders were taking place. It unnerved them the power by which these guys were living a righteous life. And he says, you guys are always resisting the Holy Spirit. He says, here we are. They considered themselves Jews at the time. Stephen would have considered himself a Jew. One who received Messiah. And he said, the difference between you and me is that I don't resist the Holy Spirit. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. And so he put it out there that way. I heard an interesting comment that just because science can give, you know, we're so science focused. Science has become the God of this age. But just because science can give an explanation for a miracle doesn't make it any less of a miracle. Many times the miracle is in the timing led by the one who controls time, who stands outside of time. We pray for healing. A normal course of an illness is shortened. How is that so? It may, you know, it may happen instantly. It may happen in a day or two. But the idea is, is that the timing is in the hands of the Lord. He's the one who performs the healing. And so often we shuffle that off and say, oh, it was science. It was good medicine. But see, the point was here, they missed their time. They missed their time. Next slide, please. Now, so the result of Stephen's speech now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. That means just pierced through the heart. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. 
But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What's very interesting is this whole thing starts out with the glory of God and it ends with the glory of God. So he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So the words had effect and their response was one they gnashed their teeth at him. You know, they didn't like what he had. They simply did not want to hear the truth. It challenged the very things that they held dear, namely their own thoughts. But even in this moment, their minds made up this anger. Can you imagine sitting there in front of 70 plus people and their entire hatred and anger directed at you? And then, so that was the situation that Stephen was in. He remained full of the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? He is the comforter, the one who comes alongside and strengthens. And his face still shone like an angel through all of this. And now he sees into heaven. And he sees Jesus, the Son of Man. Stephen is the only one other than Jesus to use this term of him. A term that Jesus loved to use of himself. But he looks up and he sees Jesus standing. They go, ah, there's another contradiction. I thought you said that he was seated at the Father's right hand. So here Stephen has it wrong again, right? The position of a king is to sit. The position of a priest is to stand. There was no furniture for seating in the temple. When the priest went on duty, they, meant they did all of their functions standing. And so here again we see Jesus as both king and priest. And here in particular in anticipation of what is to follow. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He saw the response of the Sanhedrin. He knew what they were planning to do. And Jesus stood. Even at that moment, he stood in the position of a priest, performing his role as a high priest, interceding for us, we're told before the event even happened. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and they covered their ears. That loud voice was probably, la, 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 I'm not listening. <laughs> you know, and so they, they covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. They actually did something in one accord. They, they rushed on him in a rage. Verse 58, and when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the very same one who would become the Apostle Paul, a member of the Sanhedrin. He was the one guarding the garments. It was up to the witnesses, the one who decided, that, yes, indeed, this guy's blaspheming. It was up to them to carry out the execution. But Paul was there and in agreement with them. And it's something that he always regretted. Something that haunted him, you might say, the rest of his life. Next slide, please. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. So there's Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, never left by the Holy Spirit. He was a martyr. He was a good witness, even to the point of death. But to these words sound familiar Lord Jesus receive my spirit what did Jesus say father into thy hands I commend my spirit and he said Lord do not hold this sin against them 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How could Stephen say such a thing? Because he was a follower of Messiah. He was filled with the Holy Spirit who would give him the words, even while being stoned to death. We're talking at least like cinder blocks thrown at him, dropped on his head. What does this mean to us today? This is the hope that we have for those being persecuted. And it may be us one day soon. Could Stephen have done this on his own? I would, I would say no. I would seriously doubt it. I've seen too many die without the Lord. And it's nowhere near this dignified. It's nowhere near this peace that we see described. But with the Holy Spirit, I've seen many die with them also, or with the Holy Spirit also. And the results of his peace and his strength, even in the face of death. So I think this is most instructive for us as we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters, like the ones in Kenya, like the ones marched down to the seashore, not sure if this is just another drill, you know, or if their heads are actually going to be cut off at that moment. Lord, fill them with that peace. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Let them see you in the clouds. Lord, fill them with that grace that they would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let them hear the last words like the ones who were beheaded on the beach. Let them hear their last words praising Jesus. See, that's the promise that we have, is that even at that moment, he never left Stephen. In fact, Stephen got a sneak preview. He got to look into the heavens before it even happened to see his very own high priest there interceding for him. And the things of this world had to just fade away. Last slide, please. I want to close with a prophecy that we've looked at before. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 4, the very last verse of what we consider the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6. Referring to the action of the Father in the last days. It says, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. The challenge for the church is to realize what it was that we were called to do, the faith that we are called to, to indeed have our hearts turned to the fathers. And indeed, the very hearts of the fathers return to us. What was, what was the heart of the fathers of our faith? And how we we're called to worship. To look at what was handed to our fathers in the faith, the apostles. Remember, Jesus is the cornerstone. And then we are to build upon the teaching of the apostles. What was it? How did they live? And build upon that. What was the faith that they followed? To learn and to live their lessons. To have a thorough understanding of our history and apply the lessons from it. So many times all we know is just whatever we're taught in Sunday school or, you know, some, something that we're given, handed, a message, whatever. But how many know the history of the church? How many know can take it from Acts? And follow the faith and what happened to it. And see where they began to stray. See the heresies that crept in and how they were refuted. And how finally there was the mixed marriage, the corruption mixed with 
with the world system and how that crept in to worship. How many know the history of the Waldenses or the Aubergenses? The ones who in the face of Rome went out there and continued to worship just like they did in Acts. And yet were persecuted both by the Church of Rome as well as later by the Protestants because they didn't line up with good church teaching. The dogma of man. Here in Acts 7, the account of Stephen, it sets up the pattern of rejecting the one sent the first time. Of refusing to cooperate with things and refusing to do things his way. For the Jews, that chance, that time will not come again until what you and I recognize as the second coming. When Messiah actually sets foot on the earth. But for us, what we're called to this faith, we have a very unique opportunity to follow after him, to follow after the teaching of the apostles, the word of God. And if we reject him, if we refuse to follow him, if we refuse to learn the lessons of our fathers in the faith and of our history, if we only want to stick to our way and reject his gifts and instructions like the Sadducees. We will place ourselves in that same category as them. In the same category like we saw Thomas. Who happened to miss the Lord at his first appearing. And the pattern sets up again. He missed the Lord at what is analogous to the rapture. And Thomas only saw him when Jesus came the second time. That would for us be at the end of the tribulation. That's the challenge for the church today. To carefully examine what and how we believe and to learn and apply the lessons from history. That's the meat of Acts chapter 7. Let's bow our hearts before him. Father, again, I just pray, I entreat. For each one of us, Father, let the lessons not be lost. Let the lessons not be wasted, Father. May our eyes be opened to your word, to the foundation of your Son and the teaching of those who followed him, those who were appointed by him. May we build upon that and only that. May our eyes be open to see, Father. May we be strengthened as we go forward. Father, for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted today. Lord Jesus, I pray stand up as high priest on their behalf and intercede to the Father. That they might be filled fully with your Holy Spirit, that they might be strengthened, that indeed they would see into heaven and see you, Lord Jesus. That they would be filled with the grace to pray forgiveness. That they would have the confidence to turn their spirit over into your hands. Father, that, that the name of your Son would be glorified. Father, as they step into as they leave this behind, but step into your eternal presence, I pray strengthen them. Father, you know what is ahead for us. I pray that those of us, as if we begin or as we begin to face persecution, may we be filled to that fullness with your presence, with that boldness, with that grace. Help us to see what is before us, that we may go out with wisdom and discernment in these days, knowing what it is you would have us do. Father, may your Son be glorified in our lives. For this I pray, in that most holy and precious name, that of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our soon-coming King. Amen. Mm -hmm.